Edge and presentation by Sikorsky on 5G safety implications. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the ASA uh, VTOL and uh, Rotorcraft Symposium Committee for inviting me for this presentation. Um, today's focus is going to be on a topic that you've probably heard a lot about in the last couple of years regarding the um, cellular expansion into the um, 3.8 uh, gigahertz uh, regime, which is also shared by the RAD alt uh, frequencies for all RAD altimeters operating across the world, which is between 4.2 and 4.4 gigahertz. Uh, the nature of this presentation is to uh, look and see all the effort and investigations that have happened today, uh, what regulatory actions uh, the FAA has taken, uh, what actions the uh, OEMs for the route manufacturers have taken, and what actions the OEMs and operators have been taking uh, throughout this, uh, this time frame. Before I begin, I'd just like to go over um, just some basic uh, rudimentary uh, uh, physical parameters of how a rattle altimeter operates. Uh, a rad altimeter basically is the only sensor uh, that provides true AGL above ground level measurement uh, from the actual ground surface. It uh, differs from the barometric altimeter, which just gives true altitude. Red altimeter will always show altitude above terrain. Uh, and in such, uh, it is a very basic device. It cons constitutes of two parts. Um, Older units have, used to have two components to them. Newer units all have a single unit, self-contained, uh, composed of a transmitter and a receiver. Uh, the idea is to basically focus a beam of either a frequency modulator or pulse width modulated signal to the ground uh, and then measure the time it takes to receive that reflection signal back to the receiver antenna uh, and therefore calculate uh, the actual uh, time domain into a altitude characterization. Um, Rate altimeters, as most of you know in this room, are, are, are integrated in a variety of avionic systems throughout the helicopters, uh, dealing from uh, basic flight, uh, autopilot, uh, search and rescue operation, rig approaches, DMAP, HTAWS, um, TCAS, uh, and a variety of customized functions such as rig approaches, uh, of, uh, terrain tracking, terrain following, and such. As I said earlier, there are two types of, uh, well, there are multiple types of red altimeters if you take into the military ones. The military versions have some, some really um, complex types, but the basic commercial red altimeters are composed of two types. There's the frequency modulated ones and the pulse width modulated ones. Um, the majority of newer transmitters are all frequency modulated. The pulse widths tend to be older generation ones. Um, the uh, military, uh, has kind of taken a step forward and uh, has uh, used a cipher encoded type uh, with digital hopping frequencies, but we're not going to cover that in this uh, portion of this presentation. So we're going to focus primarily on the two that you see on the bottom there, frequency modulated and pulse width modulated ones. Uh, and as I said earlier, the operating frequency uh, per the RTCA MOPS um, and the uh, TSO uh, for rad altimeters is the frequency spectrum of 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz. And, and that's uh, an important distinction that I make here because we're going to go uh, more into how that plays into the C-band 5G transmissions. Um, rad altimeters, and I don't want to belabor the point here, is, uh, is not a very reliable um, sensor in terms of precision. Uh, most red altimeters suffer from what we call uh, phasing or propag propagation absorption or reflection issues, meaning that when the signal reflects off, off of a surface uh, on its way back to the aircraft, that contact with the surface um, has a lot of effects on the intensity and stability of that signal frequency as it bounces back up. Uh, it is subject to variability uh, known as reflections, absorptions, attenuations, given if the surface is either water, ice, uh, the mineralization content of it, um, whether it's grass or tarmac, all have an effect on the um, uh, intensity of that signal return, and more importantly, how far that signal varies from the original transmit frequency range of 4.2 to 4.4. Um, so a lot of um, 
avionics integrators uh, will encompass uh, what's known as integrity monitors to basically uh, throw out bad reflections or invalid returns to provide a more stable signal to the cockpit operator so you don't see those jumps when the signal comes back as invalid. Um, almost all uh, data concentrators or, or smart displays in cockpit encompass some kind of form of integrity monitor which helps dampen um, these abnormalities that are inherent to the operation design of a radar altimeter. Uh, certification requirements are pretty straightforward. They really have not changed in a very long time. The uh, most recent uh, TSO is the 87A uh, that was dated back in 2012 and um, the European version is ED30 MPS uh, and everything still is working under DO 155. Uh, there is a special committee that has been ongoing for the past three to four years, uh, special committee 239, which is working to update uh, the MOPs for the uh, DO 155. Uh, the group, unfortunately, given the situation and the focus of the C-band um, rollout by the cellular companies, has kind of um, hit a wall, so to speak, a proverbial wall, in terms of uh, having to uh, bring in some of the focus and knowledge from that rollout into the MOPS, which has led to uh, a significant delay uh, in uh, releasing that MOPS uh, in, in its current form. Uh, currently, there is no release date for that MOPS. Uh, there is a hope that the Special Committee 239 will wrap up in 2023. Uh, but we'll wait and see if that's going to actually uh, come to fruition. So before we get into the actual issue, we talked about the RADALT and the FAA uh, side. Let's talk a little bit about the FCC. Uh, most of you have heard the term 5G. Uh, 5G really just refers to generations, right? We've had uh, 4G, 3G. Um, now we're at the fifth generation protocol for cellular communication. Um, 5G... Uh, most people are not aware of this, actually covers and spans three uh, spectrum bands. There is a low frequency band where the rollout has occurred already uh, between 450 megahertz and one gigahertz, depending on what part of the world you live in. Uh, in the US, it's uh, primarily around the 900 megahertz where they've rolled out the original 5G. Uh, we have the mid-band frequency range, which is uh, between 1 gigahertz and 7 gigahertz, but the specific focus in the U.S. is from, and most of the world, is between 3.5 to 3.89 gigahertz. And then you have high band, uh, which is 24 gigahertz to 52 gigahertz, and primarily in the U.S. and in Europe, the frequency interest is around 32 gigahertz for that. Um, one of the issues with these, uh, well, one of the benefits of the 5G, obviously, is um, you have greater bandwidth, right? So with greater bandwidth, you get better uh, uh, transmissibility. You can pack more data and transmit it over the same time period than you had with 4G. Therefore, you could get better streaming and, and better data uh, manipulation from one side of, of the network to the other. Uh, on the other hand, um, 5G uh, has an issue with penetration. In other words, uh, whereas before you had an area of, let's say, uh, two square kilometers and you can get away by having uh, two or three towers uh, for 4G, in 5G you would have to actually double that in order to get the same level of coverage for that same area. So there's a penetration and, um, uh, let's say, density issue in towers as we move forward from 4G to 5G. Um, the discussions that we're going to focus on today is actually for the mid-band of this frequency, the, the, one point, uh, the 1 gigahertz to 7 gigahertz, but more importantly, the 3.5 to 3.89 uh, zone where most of the current C-band issues and the proximity to the 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz of the RADALT frequency range uh, resides. So a little bit of history here. Uh, for those of you who may be familiar, I apologize for having to um, repeat this. Uh, approximately back in March of 2020, the FCC uh, had done a study and issued a report uh, that was uh, going to authorize usage of uh, opening up the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz spectrum for 5G use. Um, the RTCA committee that was actually working as part of the AC239 Special Committee Task Force for updating the DO155 um, diverted their interest 
and uh, conducted an investigation for potential interference from this adjacent frequency band into the uh, 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz spectrum. Um, that committee conducted uh, several tests on uh, a variety of uh, both pulse width and frequency modulated rate altimeters. Um, and concluded that there's a potential for significant interference and more importantly, um, erroneous data reporting by those rate altimeters uh, should they be uh, subjected to either uh, conductive or spurious emissions of 5G transmission. Uh, all that was published in the report uh, dated October 7th, 2020, uh, which pretty much steered up uh, a whole lot of um, attention by both the FAA, the um, airline industries, as well as uh, the commercial and uh, federal communication committees. Um, the biggest issue that we're faced here is that um, the FCC, rather than, than, than stop and, and examine the RTCA report in detail, uh, detail uh, proceeded after October 7th on uh, December of 2020 to actually conduct a bid and release the for auction the frequency uh, that was uh, contended by the RTC and the FAA. Um, and uh, several billion dollars later, uh, AT&T and Verizon, the two local U.S. companies, actually bought the spectrum uh, and um, started to um, design equipment for operation in that frequency range. So the, the, without spending too much time on the technicality, um, the issue that we really have here is kind of apparent. Um, the older rate altimeters um, that you see in the graph and uh, labeled in the slide there past uh, were designed to uh, receive uh, way uh, outside of their transmit frequency range. And, and the reason for this was um, from an operating benefit for the rate altimeters. As I said earlier, uh, rate altimeters fun uh, suffer from this inherent issue of loss of reflection and return signal based on the surfaces from which they're bouncing, uh, the signal is bouncing back up. So as a result, by opening up the reception area, they were able to grab more of the signal uh, reflections, the rate altimeter receivers, that is, uh, and they were able to actually translate that into a usable um, altitude, uh, which means you were able to meet your DO-155 um, requirements uh, without having to uh, either increase your signal or come up with a different design receiver. Um, this worked well for the industry for many years, as we all know, uh, up until um, the spectrum started being used not only in the U.S., but in Asia and here in Europe uh, by the cellular manufacturers. Uh, as you can see in the second graph, it's quite obvious what's happening is, uh, if you look at the power versus megahertz curve that I have there, the um, increased power level and proximity of the signal to the 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz uh, started interfering into the reception masks of the uh, rate altimeters, which is how we have gotten into this issue now of having the potential for interference and erroneous data uh, by the existing rate altimeters that we have um, in the market right now and in use. So one of the questions that I get is, how is this a, a European issue, right? How, or what's the difference between the US and France or the US and, and Asia or, or between other countries? Where, well, there's a lot of variability in the way 5G has been deployed. As I said, there's, there's three main bands for 5G deployment, the low band, the high band, but the focus here is the mid band. Uh, a lot of countries, for example, I'm using here France as an example, um, has actually, um, uh, the French government has actually restricted, the French telecommunication uh, folks in the French government has restricted French telecoms from actually operating in proximity of airports, uh, has uh, imposed reduced power levels versus what the US is allowing. 
um, and has also uh, incorporated something known as antenna tilt, as you see there on the far right on the schematic, where uh, the actual antenna ray is actually pointing at a downward slope, typically between anywhere between 5 and 10 degrees, which allows the center lobe of the transmission uh, not to go horizontally into the ether and is more uh, uh, directed downward in order to abate the signal much sooner. Uh, so all these have an effect of uh, mitigating uh, potential implications in attenuating signal propagation much, much, much more than the U.S. Uh, rollout would be. The other difference is, and I don't have it on the chart here, is that uh, France has a, a 200 uh, megahertz boundary between the 4.2 and uh, 3.98 uh, zone of the red altimeters, where the U.S. is only imposing a 100 uh, megahertz bandwidth spread. Uh, all these uh, intricacies lead to a variability uh, as to how an aircraft would either be subjected to spurious or conductive emissions of 5G, or it may not. Uh, and the rollout changes as you go from country to country. Uh, for example, Korea has a different protocol. Canada has a different protocol, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's no un unanimous standard as to how they have rolled out the operation in the C-band frequency. So during 2021, um, uh, and uh, basically during the, during the uh, and, and with COVID going on, um, the FAA made a, a, a coherent effort to put together several working committees, um, which I'm also a member of, uh, in terms of trying to investigate and provide both technical and regulatory guidance, um, Gamma, HAI have been, uh, from our perspective here, from the rotorcraft perspective, have been active players here. Um, we, the FAA initially tried to coordinate with the FAA, with the FCC, to um, restrict some of the um, deployments around airports as well as power levels. Uh, unfortunately, um, the FCC was not, and the cellular manufacturers were not very uh, interested in this because they've paid a lot of money for the frequency usage, and obviously um, broadband expansion uh, for the U.S. is actually uh, an economic benefit, much like it is for Europe, uh, to allow for greater expansion of Internet access across the, uh, the various countries. Um, so there was a conflicting political issue going on between the FAA and the FCC. Uh, in December of, of 2021, the FAA felt it necessary to issue um, an airworthiness directive as well as a safety uh, airworthiness information bulletin. Most of you are probably aware of that. They're all available on the uh, www.fa.gov backslash 5G website. Um, and in those bulletins, uh, the AD stipulated uh, certain limitations and locations that would uh, basically be governed by no TAMs, no fly zones, um, and that the FAA would require uh, aircraft operating in those no TAMs to have to meet a alternate means of compliance, which was accomplished via special uh, condition paper uh, through the AD. Um, so what that did is it actually launched this, this big um, assessment of all commercial altimeters by companies like Garmin and Talus and Honeywell and Collins, and to assess whether or not a bandpass filter would be required to restrict the reception mask in order to avoid susceptibility. Uh, this was no means a ultimate cure for the issue, but rather uh, a, a step in um, avoiding full stoppage of airlines operating across the U.S. and uh, airlines operating from Europe in the U.S. and Asia uh, to major airport, as well as potentially stopping uh, air transportation uh, for cargo. Um, the total cost of a total shutdown would have been something in the neighborhood of $2 billion per week, it's estimated, uh, between airline and cargo should that have occurred. Um, and again, the AMOC process was never intended to be uh, a um, long-term solution. It was a step to allow more time for the uh, investigative committees to try and find a longer-term um, plan how to deal with the increased uh, 5G transmission. So in, in parallel to what was going on in the U.S., in 2021, ICAO um, also... Uh, conducted a full review 
um, and uh, issued uh, letter SL022 to all ICAO member states, and the conclusion was that um, uh, from ICAO side was similar to what the FAA had reached, that certain rate altimeters uh, could be impaired uh, by um, uh, 5G signals in the C-band frequency uh, under certain conditions. And, and the under certain conditions is a, is a very difficult term because, um, and I'm going to say this several times today, uh, to date, based on the deployment that we have worldwide, um, out of millions of hours of flights, we have not had a single confirmed, confirmed incident of rat altimeter failure um, associated or linked to a 5G transmission. On the same side, that, that's a very difficult thing to do. I know the FAA is diligently investigating all report actions, and one of the things that the AD that I mentioned earlier does say is that pilots should have heightened awareness to potential issues of, of erroneous or undetected failures with rat altimeters and should report all such cases. Uh, the FAA has done a, an excellent job, I think, in, in following up the investigative procedure and looking into these cases. But again, to date, we have yet to find a single uh, case where we can actually link a failure to this. Um, in parallel to ICAO, um, EASA did issue a safety information bulletin also, 2021-16, December 21. Um, basically, similar assessments, um, but they did conclude that no risk of unsafe interference had been identified yet in Europe, and I know as of today, that's still the case for as, as we speak right now. Um, and it, it, this is really a, a very important point I'm bringing up here because uh, there seems to be some disparity between the laboratory assessments that have been conducted to date and real world uh, feedback. That's not to say that interference is not there or is not coming, it's just we have not been able to identify a single a real world example of a case like uh, either the US or Asia or uh, in Europe being linked to uh, a direct 5G transmission issue. So we kind of covered these ADs already. I'm just summarizing them here so everybody's aware of where we are. Um, currently, as of this moment, uh, if you are to operate, the NOTAMs are constantly updated every 30 days in the US. Um, the if you are to operate within a, and they're all listed on the FAA.gov 5G website if you want to see them, the NOTAMs are constantly expanding because the number of towers, 5G towers that are being turned on in the US is also expanding. As of today, we have approximately 50,000 uh, 5G towers operating across the continental United States. By the end of first quarter 2023, that number is expected to rise to 100,000. Um, and as of December 1st, uh, power levels are also going to be increasing. Uh, the current power level restrictions that they're operating is about 62 dBm per megahertz. Um, as of December 1st, they are going to begin raising that um, slowly to 65 dBm per megahertz. Um, and to put this into uh, layman terms, that's like going from 1.6 kilowatts to 3.2 kilowatts, so you're actually going to be doubling the power going from 62 to 65 dBm per megahertz. So it, there is an expectation that with the density increase and the increase in power, that we may start actually seeing cases of actual uh, true interference on the field. Um, so how is the FAA now dealing with this to date, and how have we been um, uh, clearing aircraft and uh, both fixed wing and rotary wing to operate within the NOTAMs. Uh, we've been using what's known as a 5G protection radius estimator tools. So what that entails is uh, we, the technical committee, uh, we worked diligently for a good year to put together a uh, macro assessment uh, estimator tool that takes in various parameters uh, of rate altimeter performance that have been measured uh, via a standard process across all manufacturers. Uh, Talus, Garmin, Honeywell, Collins, we're all part of the team. Uh, we've put together a common standard work for assessing radio altimeters in the lab. And based on those assessments, those parameters are then inserted into a, this protection radius estimator tool, which will yield uh, susceptibility um, estimator 
uh, radius, and I'll show you what that means in a second without going into too much of the math, um, based on how that radius varies from model aircraft and model radar altimeter pairing, uh, aircraft are cleared to operate in certain airports, uh, and in other airports, they may have to make modifications by introducing a filter, a uh, bandpass filter, to, to get them to clear that radius in order to operate. So uh, you can either have aircraft that are using newer red altimeters that have some capability of protection and they're less susceptible, or you may have to uh, incur the cost as an operator of actually buying and inserting a filter between your reception, a receiver and antenna in order to make the red altimeter capable of operating in that spectrum. Um, the typical process, as I said, it was a, the AMAC process is still a temporary fix. There's no long-term fix here. But the way it typically works right now, if you're an operator or a manufacturer and you want to obtain a letter of acceptance for your aircraft to operate within a restriction zone, uh, you would depend on your red altimeter manufacturer to submit the 5G protection radius statement to the FAA. The FAA would assess that. If they were okay with that, they would issue a AR-722 uh, acceptance, and then that letter would go to the OEMs or STC holders for either field approvals or production mods, whichever they prefer to do. Uh, and this is what has been going on now for the past, uh, I would say, uh, year um, uh, in the uh, U.S. airline industry. And I know a lot of European aircraft are also uh, uh, modifying and upgrading their aircraft to be able to operate within the continental United States uh, under these conditions. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to go over this again. The OEM is pretty much based on taking that previous acceptance I showed and coordinating to the tool based on what airports you'd like to use, and the FAA would clear you with an AMOC. Uh, an important distinction here, AMOCs are updated every 30 days. Uh, I, that sounds pretty work intensive, and it is. The FAA has committed a lot of resources to, to be doing this, and it's becoming quite unmanageable now as the NOTAMs are increasing in size. Um, so the every 30 days, because new towers are activated, they have to go back and look at it to see if the estimator tool has identified any additional incursions. So it is a very dynamic and painful process every 30 days to have to get new clearances uh, from the um, FAA. For example, um, for my company, for Sikorsky, uh, our 76 uh, series, S-76 series aircraft, every 30 days I get a letter from the FAA basically telling me whether I'm okay or I have to... Um, potentially invest in modifications or changes in order to get those aircraft to continue to operate. Uh, so it's a very painful process every 30 days for us. So how does the AMOC process work graphically with this estimator tool? Uh, I put this real easy example here for you to see. Um, the center there is the top-down view of a, basically a typical runway. Um, you have your typical aircraft there. Um, and around it, you'll see these blue uh, various uh, uh, transmitters, 5G transmitters that are laid out in, in front of the airport uh, landing path. Uh, what happens here, um, if your rate altimeter susceptibility data from the manufacturer shows that these uh, radius signals of the, of the 5G towers do not incur either in the airspace or on the aircraft, uh, your rate altimeter and model aircraft in this case would be good to operate and you would be issued an AMOC. Um, for red altimeters that don't perform as well, those circles, as you can see from here to here, increase in diameter. Uh, but still, even in this increase, this particular aircraft and red altimeter is still clear to operate in that airport because there's been no incursion. And then here's a case where you have a red altimeter that the radii is increased of susceptibility emissions has increased beyond the... Uh, the appropriate level and has incurred into the two mile nautical radius of the airline at the airport. In this particular case, this aircraft could not technically land in this airport due to this without having some kind of modification to the receiver end of the red altimeter or maybe even the red altimeter itself. Um, 
So here's an example. So, uh, and this is from about a month ago of what the United States NOTAMs look like. It's, it's a horrible picture. As you can see, it's practically a continuous NOTAM almost from uh, all the way up in Maine down to Florida, uh, going all the way into Texas. Uh, you can see where the density of the U.S. is. There's not a lot of density in the middle of the country, for those of you who don't know. Uh, but then you can see it picking up in California again and up in Washington and Seattle uh, up there. But um, it is expected that by next, uh, by the end, uh, next quarter, 2023, uh, this is just going to be a solid NOTAM, which is completely unacceptable. Uh, the FAA has acknowledged that they cannot continue with this AMOC process which is why they're looking now to switch to something called a signal in space. Uh, signal in space is a, is, a modeling, uh, is a model idea that you would basically clear the aircraft, the radar altimeter, and the antenna installation as one for all uh, operation, assuming that you will have interference all the time. Uh, unfortunately, that model right now is not complete. We're still working on it dig diligently. And unfortunately, we are running out of time because, as I said earlier, December 1st, the cellular industry has announced that they uh, are going to actually start increasing power levels in December 1st. Uh, when I wrote this presentation uh, a few weeks ago, they, they were still going to wait till July 2023 to do that, which is the last sentence on that slide. Unfortunately, that has changed they have upped their schedule and they're going to start phasing in on December 1st of 2022 and potentially on, and then phase two will be in March of 2023 and July of 2023 is going to be uh, basically everybody rolled in. There'll be new cellular players coming in and the market will just expand. So what does that mean with all these players coming in and, and with all this, uh, with these additional transmissions? It basically means that uh, you're, Spurious noise emission in the spectrum is going to go up. Your conductive signals are going to go up. Your main lobe strengths are going to go up. As I said earlier, we're going to be doubling the power from 1.6 kilowatts to 3.2. So the likelihood of, of real interference uh, is becoming uh, apparent here that, that we will have actual instances of 5G susceptibility. Uh, we know from the lab test that, that it will happen. Uh, I think the fact that it hasn't happened to date is largely to do with the lower power levels and the lower densities that the FCC and the cellular operators have been uh, operating under as this limited agreement. But as I said earlier, this agreement is coming to an end. So we expect to see um, this becoming a problem for everyone. Um, and it's not just a problem for the U.S. Obviously, it's a problem for, for us here in EASA, too, because if you want to sell and operate aircraft in the U.S., uh, you're going to have to do something with it because uh, just turning an aircraft over and saying, if you're going to operate in the U.S., go put your own filter to, to solve this problem is not going to be uh, a competitive answer here. Um, it, it is going to be a serious problem for, for, um, for Airbus and for other operators to, to sell and operate aircraft into the U.S. Even if flying into a U.S. airport is going to become an issue if you don't have a filter on it. So, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, these voluntary restrictions that the FCC had agreed to uh, were about to expire in July 2023, but as of last week, uh, there's been some changes to that. Uh, this whole situation is very heated in the U.S. It's very political. Uh, the FAA had sent a letter to the FCC requesting that they delay the July 2023, and rather than de delay it, the FCC announced that the cellular manufacturer are actually going to start ramping up earlier, December 1st. So uh, we're kind of going in opposite directions here uh, with regards to what the FAA is wanting and what the FCC can do. And meanwhile, we still don't have a signal and space solution to replace the AMOC process. Um, so things are looking pretty dire right now. Uh, there is expectation from the industry, from uh, A4A as well as HAI, that the FAA may actually issue a no-fly uh, as a last-ditch option um, for those aircraft and red altimeters that cannot uh, meet the NOTAM restrictions, uh, which may be just a uh, mechanism to get the FCC to a bargaining table to um, delay rollout. But um, that's going to make for a very messy uh, uh, Christmas holiday season. 
Uh, some statistics that I got from, uh, with the help of uh, John Shea from HAI here. Uh, somebody had asked me, watch, well, how many heliports and helipads do we have in the US that can be affected by NOTAMs? So if you thought you had a lot in Europe, this is what it looks like in the US. Every one of those dots is either a private, public, US Army base, or, uh, or ambulatory um, landing site for helicopters. So it's quite an impressive uh, map there. So some, some, one of the, some of the things that we need to distinguish here from a rotorcraft perspective to us versus fixed wing. Um, so what would happen if we had an erroneous undetected um, call out? Let's say you were at 100 feet and the out rad altimeter was reporting 50. For helicopters, that's not a very big deal for many of our flight moves. It is for certain maneuvers like NVG potentially, uh, rig approach, probably uh, LPV for missed approach points, if you would get an erroneous missed approach point. But category B operations for helicopters don't really require us to have a rat alt in, in the aircraft, which, which is a good thing because it, it, you can always say, I'm going to operate the aircraft under category B and get away with it. But if you're, if you're doing specific um, NVG operations or, or, or you need to do rig approaches, that, that would create a problem. Um, the, the other benefit that we have here is that um, the FAA was wise enough to actually give an exception to emergency services and ambulatory services for helicopters from these restrictions to allow for helicopters to get into areas to evacuate either people or, or, or to provide uh, trauma relief or support for those uh, cases. So we do have an exception for that, even though it's a temporary exception. Um, the fixed wing community has a big problem. The fixed wing community uh, has a serious issue because there's a lot of the functions of, of, of these uh, larger aircraft, larger jets, depend on rad altimeter, on the very final approach, as to how to handle their landing sequence. Particularly, they have auto throttles, flap deployments, uh, Cat 1 procedures, and obviously their closure rates are much faster than a helicopter. So you can imagine if you're coming in with a uh, 777 and, and you're, the aircraft... Uh, the rattle gets an erroneous uh, uh, indication due to 5G interference and, and thinks it's at 20 feet uh, and you're actually at uh, 50 feet and it deploys flaps or starts auto throttles back or, or thrust reversers, you got a serious problem. You're looking at a potential total loss of the aircraft. So the fixed wing community is, is, is much, much worse in terms of hazards. The majority of hazards uh, on a helicopter uh, for, for erroneous, undetected rad alt, with the exception of the few that I mentioned, uh, such as rig approach and LPV, are primarily major. We don't have catastrophic failure conditions to the level that the fixed wing community has. But nonetheless, it is still an issue for us, uh, much as it is for the fixed wing, but to a lesser degree. So how many aircraft does this kind of affect? I put, I put the Sikorsky numbers here so you guys can get a feeling at least from, from what we're doing at Sikorsky. Um, uh, right now, uh, we have approximately uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 776 aircraft total. Um, all of those have AMOC approvals that get renewed uh, monthly through um, the FAACO with Dave Swartz. Uh, the current 92 fleet, we have about 307 fielded aircraft. Um, that one we are working with, Honeywell right now, is actually certifying a new filter for the RT300. Um, and we're going to be doing it later this uh, month to get that certification underway. But something important that I have to make a distinction here is this filter, as well as the AMOX for the 76, were all qualified to the lower levels, meaning the 32 dBm around airports, the 62 dBm transmissions, and the previous uh, NOTAMs that you saw on the map that I had before. Going forward into 2023 and starting in December of 2022, I'm going to have to go back with the FAA and rework these numbers because I'm gonna be dealing with different transmission numbers. So those susceptibility radii that I showed earlier in the graph are gonna alter tremendously. So where, where before you may have had a, a rad altimeter mo aircraft model combination that worked, going forward December 1st, that may not be the case anymore. And right now, as of this moment, we don't have a solution as to how to get 
that cleared with the FAA. We, we meet practically every day on this issue uh, with a very, very diverse team uh, with a lot of subject matter experts and a lot of smart people, and we still can't come to a solution here. Unfortunately, this is not a solution that the avi avi aviation community can resolve because we are largely dependent on how the FCC and the cellular industry deploys this. Um, and again, I think uh, I, I said this once, I'll say it again, this is not a U.S. problem only. This is a world problem um, that we're going to have to deal with at some point. And the sooner that, that we put a focus team to start working with the FAA and putting pressure on the cellular communities to better manage their spectrum and their trans transmission levels, um, the sooner we will get to a solution. Uh, some, 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 of the, some of the folks uh, that I've talked to, particularly in the government, have, have always asked me, well, why don't, we, um, why don't we finish 239, make it into uh, MOPS, and then have the red altimeter manufacturers go build us new red altimeters that will work, that won't receive outside of the 4.2 to 4.4 gigahertz spectrum. Um, th that's a great idea, and I can assure you, we all thought of that already. Uh, the problem is, is the MOPS is not out. We still are trying to get those MOPS out. Um, and red altimeter manufacturers are, are not ready to invest yet in designing new red altimeters because it's a very expensive proposition. They still need to get actual data for the spectrum that these red altimeters are going to be operating in. And um, we will uh, basically uh, not have red altimeters at earliest until 2025. So I'll stop here. There's a few more slides. Um, the one thing I do want to show you is that we did do testing at Sikorsky uh, with the Department of Defense in 2022 of March. I actually had the ability to set up a test uh, out in Utah with a Black Hawk helicopter, and Verizon was, uh, was very nice in working with us and providing us a mobile unit. Um, I can tell you we flew, I flew the aircraft, uh, my pilots flew the aircraft within 200 feet of the antenna array, and we did not have any issues. Now, granted, the highest power level on that unit was only 58 dBm versus the 65 dBm that we we're going to be facing, but nonetheless, we were not able to get the red altimeter to fail um, in this situation. Um, and we did similar tests with uh, 777s, 777s. We actually tested our Lockheed C-130. We did our Blackhawks. We did an F-18. Um, we did not, we're not able to get any of those aircraft to show a failure on their uh, red altimeters today. But again, we were using the lower power levels because that's, that's, that's as high as they could go with the mobile units. They weren't able to go much higher. Uh, and then just uh, some general stuff here. Uh, I put together some things about Europe. As you can he see here, um, uh, um, all these countries, uh, Finland's been operating since 2018. Uh, Switzerland's been operating since 2019, 5G. Um, Spain has been operating uh, 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 even closer to the US levels. Um, none of these have any cases reported of interference to date. So um, it's very hard to, see, to say where reality ends, it begins and where the uh, laboratory tests end here or vice versa. So again, all lab indications and calculations do show an interference. Unfortunately, we have yet to be able to, to catalog a, a, a single event to date after millions and millions of flight hours. And obviously, I put some Asian numbers here for you to see also. Japan has over 90,000 5G sites, uh, no issues there. Um, and uh, and uh, the uh, South Korea also has about 195,000. Uh, they're, they're operating obviously a little bit lower than, than the rest. They only go up to 3.7, but um, there's no issues of interference or anything. So on that note, uh, I'm just gonna end it here. Uh, I think I've covered pretty much everything in the slides uh, and I'll turn it over. Thank you.